Rage 2. A spectacular open world. Violence. Vehicle combat. Violence. Scenic views. Violence. Parallel parking. Violence. More scenic views. Violence. Tail butt plugs. Violence. Welcome to Rage 2. Basically, it's mostly about violence. Generally, I think it's worth beating a game before reviewing it. Frequently, the worst possible kind of review comes from people that dip into the game for a few hours to grab footage, then squeeze out some two-dimensional review, proclaiming either how super awesome or how terribly bad the game is, based on what publisher they work for. Usually the best possible reviews come from people who hammer the game until they know it inside out and reflect on the experience in its entirety and give a comprehensive and unbiased opinion. Obviously, this can sometimes be problematic because some games require a thousand hours to master, whilst just speed running the main questline of games like Fallout 3 is not really going to give you a full perspective, even if it is technically beating the game. I say all of this because I have not completed Rage 2 before reviewing it. I simply can't, and it's not because it's a huge game. Part of the issue is that I only enjoy this game in small doses, and I struggle to play it for more than a few hours at a time. Following from this, I decided not to force myself to, because frankly it would probably put me off the game. And I am enjoying it. A lot. In small doses. This said, after getting about halfway through, I'm fairly sure I can appreciate the logical and predictable trajectory of this game. It's not like the movie Dust Till Dawn or The Matrix. There is no epiphany moment coming that will fundamentally transform the experience and change my entire understanding of the game universe. Rage 2 is a game about driving and killing. And mostly, it's just about killing. And I only like playing it for about an hour at a time. And I think that's okay, because not all games are designed for you to sit down and grind for 14 hours straight. Thank God. Rage 2 is a post-apocalyptic, open-world, first-person shooter developed by Avalanche Studios, with creative oversight from id Software. It's the sequel to the first sci-fi first-person shooter racing game, Rage, released in October 2011. I literally copy and pasted that out of the Rage 2 wiki. But unlike all the other reviewers who did that, I at least admitted it. So yeah, it's made by Avalanche Studios who make decent games, supervised by id Software who make legendary games, and published by Bethesda Softworks who would sell crack cocaine to preschoolers if there was a fucking profit to be made. So what about the atmosphere, story and my first impressions of the game? So let's set the scene. A post-apocalyptic event happens, in this case an asteroid, which causes society to descend into chaos. Well I say chaos, but really it's that kind of super organised post-apocalyptic video game version of chaos, where everything is neatly self-structured into different factions with different uniforms and different difficulty settings, who squabble amongst themselves according to a set of strictly defined rules. You know, like a fucking ant's nest. It looks superficially chaotic, but in reality it's highly structured and organised. You are a part of a group of good-ish guys slash girls, who I think are the last of the rangers and you head out to make the world a better place by murdering and stealing loot because some random fucks attacked your base. 
you know, it's pretty much the standard post-apocalyptic blueprint. Fallout has vaults. The Division 2 has sleeper agents. Rage 2 has arcs. Same shit, different apocalypse. Look, it's safe to say the story is fucking weak and fucking generic. There is an inciting incident, so you head off to kill, loot and level up. Everyone in this world is pretty much an idiot, including you. You kill everyone because killing is frequently the only means to meaningfully interact with a virtual environment to make the world a better place in video games. Rage 2 is no exception. The first and frankly only act of player agency at the start is picking your gender. Sorry, character. A lot of video games these days don't let you choose between male and female anymore because it's not progressive. You have to pick body type or character type in this strange age of outrage we live in where you can have your entire social media account banned just for saying there are only two genders. Personally, I think gender is a more complex issue than two simple boxes to pick from. I'm not some ignorant barbarian. I've fucking been to Bangkok. I am familiar with the concept that not every pretty girl at the bar uses the sit down toilet. I know all about that little fella that became a champion kickboxer to make money so he could pay for a sex change. I think it's a great story a personal triumph. Although now he's retired from professional kickboxing and become a lady, she's not particularly attractive in my humble opinion and at the risk of sounding prejudiced, I don't really find people sexually attractive after they've, well, been punched and kicked in the head hundreds of times. In fact, I can only think of three girls and one of them's my cousin. I'm not picking on Rage 2 for the political correctness, by the way, and I am undoubtedly reading too much into this. But I'm just mentioning this lack of gender thing because Rage 2 reminded me that I'm seeing this everywhere now. The words male and female now seem to be considered problematic and lots of video games now avoid these terms completely. You just don't see them on the fucking screen. I just personally find it quite amusing that so many game companies have rightly started designing their games so that you can play as male or female protagonists and almost as soon as this becomes the industry standard, now they're too shit scared to write the words male and female on the fucking screen in case they trigger some kind of backlash. Although it's worth noting that the guy who wrote the subtitles clearly didn't get the fucking memo. Talking of backlash, lots of people are losing their shit about the vehicles in Rage 2. I actually thought they were fucking great, and driving them was hysterical. I think the difference of opinion here is caused by people's experiences of driving in real life. If you've only ever driven some fucking Prius where a computer controls every single aspect of your vehicle, or you're most comfortable in some little front wheel drive shop hopper, then yes, the cars are going to feel weird and hard to control. I tend to drive shitty old rear wheel drive cars or occasionally a van so for me having the back end slide out is perfectly normal. In fact when I drive a car I assume that the handbrake is primarily there for steering. Seriously the in-game vehicles are a lot of fun as long as you handbrake into tight turns and power slide through them. Do that and you are golden. The most simple way I can describe Rage 2 is this. You know those stealth shooters where you spend ages scoping out the base from a distance with binoculars, spotting the targets, memorising the patrol routes and planning your attack? Then you sneak in tactically and move through the shadows, wiping out half the base before they even suspect something is going on? Yeah well Rage 2 is the exact fucking opposite to that. Rage 2 is more along the lines of stab yourself in a chest with a syringe full of adrenaline, scream murder, 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 kill, 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 and then run at the nearest enemies, do some kind of techno science head smashing superpower before sticking your shotgun up the arse of the nearest bad guy and turning him into some surreal reinterpretation of a rectally propelled bottle rocket. Possibly the best way to describe the combat in Rage 2 is that it's technically anti-combat. Think of every single sensible realistic bit of advice you know about real modern warfare. Keep low and stay behind cover. Don't rush into obvious enemy kill zones and ambushes. Try and gain a tactical advantage over your enemy before engaging. Rage 2 
is not like that. Rage 2 is the opposite of that. It's the exact opposite of common fucking sense. If Rage 2 was a drill instructor, it would be the kind of drill instructor that would teach you eight different ways to gouge a man's eyes out with a fucking spork, but completely forget to teach you map reading. This game positively promotes rad and gun combat, as trained in the Faceplant Academy of Military Sciences. Frequently sniping safely from a distance is unrewarded, tiresome and ineffective. You are rewarded for rushing in like a fucking twat. A lot of the skills and boons are all built to synergise around the concept of stringing together chains of brutal close range kills. Most of your best superpowers are close range, and one of the most brutal firearms is a shotgun. There is a clue there. Not only does it do it well, but the mechanics actually got me charging in like a fucking idiot, and I'm the world's most tepid and overly timid FPS player in history. There is just something about the way it's mechanically set up that constantly encourages and trains you to get more and more stuck in and abandon caution. I was impressed because the game persuaded or unconsciously trained me to play in a style outside my normal comfort zone. An honorary mention needs to go to the voice acting cast, whilst not being famous famous like say the cast of Fallout New Vegas, which looks like a front row of an Oscars audience, nevertheless the voice actors in Rage 2 have some real heritage. You will probably remember a few of them from games like Fallout Franchise, Bioshock, World of Warcraft, Naruto and Mass Effect. For example, the male iteration of Walker is voiced by Sam Regal, aka Chris Havisham from Fallout New Vegas, and Courtney Taylor who has basically been in every video game this century. Not even sure if I'm exaggerating. There's also Neil Ross, the Codex narrator from Mass Effect 2. To activate any dormant mass relays discovered. A practice considered dangerous and irresponsible by council aligned races. Okay, I'm nerding out now, but my point is, had they decided to give Rage 2 a proper fucking story arc, you know, one that people might remember, with a plot and stuff, and three-dimensional characters, I'm fairly sure the voice actors would have been up to the task. For me, the creative and narrative design of Rage 2 seemed to be a collection of great ideas, concepts and characters thrown together in an incoherent jumble, with no real cohesion drawing it together into a singular world. Let's be fair, you spend most of the game fist fucking people's skulls into walls and shooting people in the nuts with a pump action shotgun, so this problematic bit of game design isn't exactly going to keep you awake at night. But on those rare moments when you're taking pause for thought and soaking up the atmosphere, you will quickly realise that there isn't much atmosphere. The open world and narrative has come under quite a lot of criticism for being a bit uninspired, and to be fair, it kind of is a bit. It's worth noting that from a creative point of view there is some interesting moments. I won't go into detail and give spoilers but some of the locations, creepy characters and cutscenes are noteworthy for being original, imaginative and dare I say it, artistic. I can't figure out why it doesn't all gel together to make a unified coherent package but some of the individual elements are really cinematic and memorable. It's actually fucking weird having a game that lacks character overall, yet has such great little moments throughout the whole thing. So what about the weaponry? The combat philosophy of the game is somewhat reflected in the weaponry. The most immediately satisfying and overpowered weapon is of course, the shotgun. Most things will die pretty damn quick if you can close the distance and jam this fucker into their top lip and play hunt the eyeballs. Right off the bat the Sidewinder pistol and assault rifle seem like reasonable guns, but even the vanilla shotgun feels like an I win button, and frankly the rocket launcher doesn't really feel more powerful than the shotty, it just affords ranged effectiveness and the almost sexual delight of watching those missiles trace into their targets. The BFG is locked behind DLC, so that can eat a pile of dicks, and the nostalgic inclusion of the entirely pointless settler pistol is, well, 
pointless. It's pretty much like any Doom-like game. There are a couple of ideal weapons for any situation, therefore the situation dictates your weapon choice pretty much. But if I get out my crystal ball, I will say right now that most players will be using the shotgun. A lot. If you want a full breakdown of the weapons, I strongly suggest you go over to Vinylic Puma and check out his weapon breakdown video. So let's talk about the mechanics of the gameplay. It's kind of odd that the game feels quite open worldy, but is not looter shootery. It feels a bit strange that you can't pick up any guns and you can only upgrade through quests. I guess this is a reminder that really this is an open world doom, not an FPS version of Fallout. The flip side of this is that you are relieved of the almost spiritual burden of loot addiction. I love looting, but fucking hell, sometimes the addiction of constantly having to loot everything and micromanage your inventory every waking moment can get annoying. Sometimes it can feel like it impedes a game, not enhances it. This game feels like it's taken a knife and cut the straps on your rucksack and said, just run away and have fun. The game will take care of looting for you. And you know what? It feels liberating. There's no more loot anxiety. You don't have to worry that you might have left a tasty drop on that one fucking mob 150 yards away just because it might have an extra plus 2% crit on it. You play. The game deals with the gear. It's actually like having a loot holiday. And I started to enjoy it. The user interface is fucking appalling. Navigating the UI is so pointlessly counterintuitive and complicated, it practically qualifies as a minigame in its own right. In-game progression, projects and weapon upgrades are all mashed into this fucking ridiculous system of menus and sub-menus and subsystems and fucking tabs and clearly never got reviewed and streamlined. I mean seriously, at one point I found out by accident that I was sitting on 20 plus of these squirrely token things that I could spend on skills and it was hidden in some sub-menu option. The UI is fucking bad and I'm talking fucking obstructively bad. Hoovering up the last of the lootable chests in each base or arc location is an unnecessary ball ache. There always seems to be one or two loot chests you just can't find. You end up fucking around hunting for them and it is zero fun. Frequently it creates this annoying behavioural pattern that goes like this. You go to a location, murder everything, Loot as you go, you murder more, you have fun. Then after checking on your screen, you find you are four of five loot chests complete. Then you spend a very annoying five minutes trying to find that one last fucking chest. Rinse and repeat. I think when you've totally cleared out a location of enemy NPCs, the chests should glow through the terrain or something, or auto loot, because this shit this shit is not fun. Twice I had to go on fucking YouTube and find a guide video to find out where the last chests were hidden and I just don't see the point of that. As for bugs, it's got a few low level non game breaking bugs and annoyances but to be honest I barely noticed. This said the upgrade of modding UI is such a baffling exercise in counterintuitive mind fucking it could have been semi-broken and I wouldn't have been able to tell what was me and what was broken and what was pure design fucktardery. Suffice it to say though, I never found myself swearing at bugs, glitches or any shit like that. I did however find myself swearing at the UI and swearing whilst trying to find the last loot chest in any given location though. So what about the uh, dirty business? Well, there is an in-game store. The fourth word in the menu I read was store. Dear Lord, the store is full of shitty skins. The cheapest start at £3 per skin and work upwards. Fucking cheap ass con right there. The pre-order bundle I got came with a wizard's bag of cheat code fuckery or something. Basically they were selling cheat codes, what the fuck. 
On one hand, I thought it was outrageous they were selling cheat codes, and on the other hand, I thought it was dumb to buy cheat codes in a single-player PvE game where the normal setting is basically easy. I mean, why, why cheat? But then again, selling cheat codes is incredibly low. The BFG for sale was technically pay to win. It's a crime with only one victim. The sucker who paid for a gun in a single player game. I bought the deluxe package because I was reviewing the game. Personally though, I think the extra mission is the only reason to. I think frankly having one of the best guns behind a paywall is shit. Even if it does cost $1,000 per shot. It's still pay to win, albeit a very, very silly and expensive pay to win, both in game and in real life. I just think the deluxe edition was handled badly. You get a pointless weapon, useless skins, and a mission that should be in the base game. A fairly badly executed plan, executed badly. And the only purpose was extracting a few more quid. In the grand scheme of video game fuckery, this game isn't so bad. But the extra revenue they gained was probably not worth the humiliation of this kind of fucking stupidity. So let's talk performance. The game wouldn't launch right off the bat. And even though I updated my Windows install and all my drivers just a few weeks ago, I still found myself spending the first hour troubleshooting and eventually found out it would not run without the Nvidia drivers released four days earlier. A plus point was that they allow you to sort out all your settings before anything happens. I positively love this feature. One of my personal pet hates is games that force you to complete the whole intro and tutorial with fucked up default settings and non-inverted white axis on the mouse, so bravo for this common sense move. It does have Battlefield franchise levels of key mapping between the driver issue and rebinding keys to a workable but not finished state. That was the first hour and a half right there. I'd say workable because you know the drill, with multiple mappings across multiple vehicles and the player. 30 minutes into the game, you're driving your first car and as you try and turn, you jump out accidentally and eat tarmac because you've over mapped a keybind. It was annoying, but not that bad given you have a lot of skills and abilities you need to keybind. So, you know, it's going to be a bit of a shag at first. I found a field of view slider, which was great, but it wasn't immediately clear where the frame rate cap was, but I think I found it. The intro battle serves as a tutorial on the fly, which I personally like. Overall, aside from a bit of key map fuckery and a driver update, the game runs pretty well. So what's my overall evaluation of Rage 2? Rage 2 is first and foremost a violent idiot simulator, and it does it well. You get to play the role of a violent idiot, being violent to other violent idiots. It's not some tactical stealth shooter, it's the kind of game that makes an infantry charge in the Battle of the Somme look like a good idea. It's a game where recklessly charging headfirst into raking enemy fire is not only encouraged, it's rewarded with cookies. It's impossible not to at least mention Doom because of the parallels, the involvement of id software, and because every last motherfucker is comparing the two. But then again, you could compare Rage 2 with about 20 post-apocalyptical games because it really feels like it's derivative of everything. It's a little bit Rage 1, Doom, Borderlands, Mad Max, Fallout, Titanfall, Far Cry, and dare I say it, Sometimes the gunplay reminded me a little bit of Call of Duty, in a Treyarchy kind of way. From zip wires to power jumps, from road wars to tweaker enemy NPCs, this game draws a little bit from everything, but never manages to define itself. It's basically trying to deliver a Mad Max experience where the protagonist also has such shockingly effective superpowers that they only use a gun at all because of the cooldown timers. We're living in an age of live service fuckery and games as a service bullshit bonanzas, so it's frankly nice to see a discreet, self-contained game. 
This is a mid-price game, offering better than mid-price entertainment, and despite a few bugs and glitches, it's finished at launch, which is becoming increasingly uncommon. It's reasonably priced and you get to shoot things and smash dickhead skulls into blood vapour. It's not going to change the world, but they never claimed it would. I've come to realise now you have to attenuate your impressions of a game based on the publisher. Ubisoft has a public relations operation as expansive and sophisticated as China's Ministry of Propaganda and is now technically affiliated with that precise organisation. So if a Ubisoft game is getting 10 out of 10, it's probably a 5 or a 6. As a rule, deduct 4 to 5 points from all of their reviews, because they probably paid for them. Bethesda Softworks, on the other hand, has a fairly shit PR apparatus, and it's suffering from the aftermath of its disgraceful and shameful complicity in Fallout 76. So with the case of Rage 2, I would add one or two points to all the reviews. It's not particularly well received, but it's better than most reviews give it credit for, as long as you know what you're getting. They definitely should have either hired a better writing team or allowed the existing one more scope to take risks, the in-game story is about as imaginative as an in-flight safety presentation. Are you willing and able to assist with the operation of the exit if necessary? No. If you're unable to perform these functions, please let us know and we'll be happy to find you another seat. Okay, maybe slightly less than that. The story, whilst being coherent, lacks flavour to such a degree you could probably draw it as a circuit diagram and not really compromise the emotional content. Overall though, I could see where this game was heading, and I gotta admit I liked it. As you get more skilled and experienced, you move from being roadkill to road warrior. The first time I took a pop at one of those big convoys, I pretty much just spunked all my ammo and annoyed them, the same way a fly annoys a camel. On the last time I tried, I was about 500 rounds short of taking out the last vehicle. If I'd managed that, then I guess I would have got something nice as a reward. Not that I know factually, because I think I skipped that part of the tutorial, and therein lies the biggest single problem with the game. The story, narrative and world of Rage 2 failed to hook me enough to profoundly care about what was going on, so I tended not to read the notes, listen to the cutscenes, study the information presented to me, or frankly, pay much attention to any in-game info at all. This combined with a UI which boasted groundbreaking and cutting edge levels of fuckery and confusion resulted in me not really knowing nor caring what the fuck was really going on most of the time. Sure, I enjoyed the killing and blowing shit up, because let's face it, killing and blowing shit up is immensely satisfying, and a video game like this gives the player a great opportunity to practice those honourable and venerable professions in a safe and consequence-free environment before heading out into the world to do it for real. But ultimately, the game encourages you not to really care about finding out what is going on, and it's built from the ground up to confound any fucking attempt to understand it by using the user interface. Nearly every character advancement and upgrade mechanic I learned from trial and error, and mostly error. The game was very old fashioned in the way it did not give a shit about coaching you through certain sections and giving hand holding tutorials, and even when it did, I frequently just skipped them. Not a problem in itself. But in this kind of a no-brainer game, the information should be served up on a plate. The real question with Rage 2 is this. For what problem is Rage 2 the solution? The world doesn't desperately need another open world shooter right now. Certainly not one that does everything fairly well, but doesn't really excel at anything or do anything new. But if you enjoy the basic gameplay and video game violence delivery systems of Rage 2, you will be happier than a pig in shit. This game is one dimensional, and that dimension is violence. And it does it pretty well. Rage 2 is a video game, in the same way that John Wick is a story. I mean, what is the plot of John Wick movies? 
Uh, killing. And I think there's a dog in there somewhere. Just like Rage 2 is killing. And I think there's a car in there somewhere. Nobody will remember the plot of Rage 2. And I don't think that matters one fuck. John Wick movies barely even have a fucking script. And they're brilliant. It's also worth noting that it's not an epic exclusive. So it gets an extra star from me right there. We've had a few years of bullshit live service games, of relentlessly lying publishers, bullshitting reviews, pedo cash swindles and broken promises. And on top of this, now we're getting Epic Store exclusives. So perhaps a simple, straight up single player shooter with no loot crates is precisely what the industry, the consumer and especially Bethesda Softworks needs right now. Rage 2 is just an old fashioned video game product. It's reasonably priced and delivers on the deal. This is the perfect game for someone who wants to shotgun Mountain Dew and snort crushed up Viverin. It's a game to play when you want killing to be enjoyable, when you don't really want to think too hard, or maybe not even think at all. I know I've sounded a bit uninspired by Rage 2, but at least I can say this. After I review most games, I never touch them again, but Rage 2 is staying on my PC. And every few days, I will probably play for a little bit, just for a violence fix, and because I get where it's all heading. As your magazines get bigger, your cooldowns get shorter, and your skills get more powerful, eventually, all of your abilities expand outwards, overlap, and allow you to seamlessly string huge shitstorm combos of ultra violence together in an epic skull vaporizing crescendo. That's the ultimate endgame of Rage 2. Smash, smash, fucking smash. But for now, good luck and happy hunting. Bye.